So the honor is all mine. Um, it really is. It's been an extraordinary few days, and I'm extremely grateful and honored to be here with you. Uh, I decided not to come with a prepared presentation, but rather to listen and learn and try and respond um, immediately to what I had um, learned. So what, what you're going to get is a rather rapidly put together and partially improvised presentation. Um, but uh, I, I hope you'll join me for the ride. Um, it's a bit nerve wracking, but we'll see how it goes. So I, I want to start with, um, with a thing I did discover beforehand. Uh, uh, sometime in the eighth century, a monk from Verona penned some lines in a language which is taken to be the beginning of the Italian language. It was one of the first texts in what was to become the Italian language, somewhere halfway between Latin and Italian. He wrote this riddle. Se pareba boves alba pratalia araba alba versoria teneba negro semen seminaba. It means driving oxen before him, tilling the white fields, holding a white plow, sowing black seed. So what was the monk talking about? Of course, he was talking about writing. It was a riddle of writing. The black seed is, of course, the words that he's putting down. The plough is the pen, and the white fields are the page. And in the days when the monk was writing, everybody knew how to uh, handle a plough and till a field, but not many people knew how to write. So he was drawing in this riddle drawing on the f experience that was familiar to everyone to explain this rather specialized craft of his own, of, uh, of plowing the field of the page with his pen. Of course, now it's the other way around. Uh, everybody, or almost everybody knows how to write, but hardly anybody knows how to plow a field. And that is indeed part of the source of our problem that we're dealing with. Nobody has the knowledge of how to raise, or few people have the knowledge of how to grow crops from the earth. So it's, it's a good place to start from. And the immediate question it raises is, how do we understand the ground itself? The, in the riddle, the monk is imagining himself as a farmer, tilling, plowing the ground. And he compares that with his writing on the page. Now, he, of course, was writing with a pen on parchment. And that parchment originally came from the back, from the skin of a living animal. It could have been a sheep, a goat, or perhaps a young calf. Um, and it immediately leads us to think of the difference between the living animal and the skin of the living animal, which is the source of the parchment, and the skin of, say, a taxidermist model. A taxidermist's model. Look at a, a model or a, 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 a stuffed animal in a museum, and it is dead, but it looks lifelike because the taxidermist has covered what is just filling of some kind with the, act the skin, recovered skin of an actual animal. So what is the difference between the skin on the taxidermist model and the skin of the real living animal. Well, the difference, of course, apart from the fact that one is alive and the other is dead, is that when you cut the skin on the model, you can cut through it. You cut through what is a layer to discover some filling substance underneath. If you cut the skin of an animal, you get flesh. You don't cut through it, you cut into it. And when the scribe was writing on parchment, likewise, he was not dealing with a surface that you could cut through with a top side and an underside, and like a sheet of paper, one the other. He was actually cutting into something like the ground. When you plow the ground, the ground is not like a sheet of paper with the underground being something underneath. You, you, you uh, inscribe your lines into the ground, but you can't cut through the ground because beneath the ground is just more ground. Underground is not 
is itself ground. So clearly there's a difference between the living animal and the taxidermist model, and a difference then between the kind of surface inscribed in when the uh, scribe writes on parchment, and perhaps what we might be more used to think of as a sheet of paper. And in the, in the case of the living animal, we could say that the skin dresses the animal, but in the taxidermist model, the skin dresses up the model. So now think about the ground again. Does the ground cover the land or does the ground cover up the land? And if we return to the question of the page and the similarity between the ground and the page, the question is, does the page have one side or two? Here it seems to have this side and this side. So you go through it if you want. You can go from the top down to the bottom. But in the parchment, there isn't actually another side. Although you can, you, you, in order to get from recto to verso, from one side of the parchment to the other, you have to turn the page. You can't, you can turn the page, you can go from one vista to another, but you cannot go through it. Now, uh, because parchment was expensive uh, in medieval times and rather scarce, it was often used many times. Uh, so you would take a sheet of par parchment, you would write on it. Uh, then if you wanted to reuse it, you would have to take the same knife that you used for sharpening your quill and you would scrape it and carry on scraping it until as much of, as possible of the original inscription would disappear and then you would write on it again. And then the same thing again, you would scrape and then you would write on it again. And uh, as is well known, the uh, paleo paleo paleographers uh, refer to this as the palimpsest. But actually the palimpsest is a rather more curious surface than you might think. Often people think that, oh, it's just layering one inscription on top of another. But that's not what's happening because between each round of inscription, the surface is actually being scraped down. There's a process of erosion. And if you imagine uh, in, a, in a landscape, then what happens is actually that past inscriptions gradually come up through this process of erosion while new ones dig down. So far from imposing one layer of inscriptions on another, what is happening is a kind of turning in which the past is continually coming up as the present deeps down. So there's a process of renewal that takes place not by adding one layer on another. Well, first this, then we'll renew it, we'll put a new layer on, then a new layer, and like, a new, like, like wallpapering a room, you know, and you, you're fed up with one pole wallpaper, so you put on another and then another and then another, and then you find there are all these different layers of wallpaper. That's not what's happening in the palimpsest, quite the opposite. You are, uh, you're continually uh, turning the ground over. So the ground is, is what you might call uh, a deep surface, a surface that does not, not like a sheet of paper as though here was the sky on top and the earth underneath, but rather a surface in which the earth's rising, as the earth rises up into plant and animal, meets the skies falling, in the, particularly in, in, in wind and weather that is operating its erosive effects on the land. So in the deep surface, it's not like an interface between what's above and what's below, but it's actually a place where the earth's rising meets the skies falling. And that is where everything grows and lives in that place, in that zone of interpenetration. So the ground as a deep surface is where the earth's rising meets and mingles with the skies falling and it is renewed through turning using the plough. Now suppose we compared the plough as maybe the main instrument of medieval cultivation and the bulldozer as the iconic instrument of modernity. What does the bulldozer do? It takes whatever is around in the land 
and scrapes it all away, pushes it all away, removes it in order to create a tabula rasa, in order to, uh, to create a, a clean sheet on which to build something, a blank, blank slate, empty ground. So what is the difference between the, this is what I'm thinking, what's the difference between the kind of erasure that goes on when you're going to reuse a parchment or plow a field again for re-sowing and the kind of erasure that the bulldozer does when it simply sweeps everything away and produces a blank slate. And I think uh, this has to do with a difference between what I call unearthing and um, excavation. The plow unearths in the sense of bringing something up. The bulldozer excavates in the sense of creating a vacuum. It, it, excavation is actually re the removal of substance rather than turning it over. And uh, I came to think in many of our discussions about questions of, of burial. Uh, the philosopher Giambattista Vico famously uh, uh, speculated, probably wrongly, but he famously speculated that the word human came from the word for soil, humus, and is related to the fact that humans, in his view, were rather distinctive in the practice of burying their dead. So for Vico, humans were fundamentally creatures of the soil, and that's why they were called humans. Uh, scholars have disputed this particular etymology, and we have no uh, grounds for, for deciding one way or the other. But we can say that, that, that burial is something that humans not all humans, but many humans do, and, and that we do have through that burial a fundamental relation to the earth and to the soil. The important thing then is that when, when we bury the dead, it's not to put them down forever so that as time passes, they sink lower and lower and lower and lower. The point of burial is so that the past can be renewed, so that it can come back up again. So if you bury your ancestors correctly, those that burial will then serve as a root for the growth of future life. So the difference between the plow and the bulldozer, or between burial and excavation, excavation, the removal of substance, is that burial is about renewal. Uh, it's a part of the story of the, of the renewal of life Excavation is part of a story of putting the past behind us and creating a blank slate upon which to build the future. So they entail quite fundamentally different understandings of the relation between past and present. And to my mind, the fundamental issue here is about how we imagine generations and how we think about the generation of life. Now, throughout most of human history, we could say that generations have been aligned longitudinally, rather like the strands of a cord or a rope. So we have uh, uh, one line of life. Let's go, let's go horizontally, it's easier to gesture. So here, 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 here's a person living along their life, and at some point they have a child and that child lives along. And for a long time, the, the, the parent and the child live along together. And maybe the child has another child. We have a three-generation family. So the, so the original, uh, the original uh, growth, uh, strand, uh, splits into two and then into three, but then one of them dies off, but another strand is introduced, and so they carry on. So that life is lived actually in the overlap of generations, carrying along together, uh, twining around one another, rather like the cords of uh, the, the strands of, of a rope as they weave. And although, uh, as, it, as in the rope, um, no strand, if it's made of, of some plant fiber or whatever, there's a limit to how long any strand can be. No strand goes on forever, just as no life goes on forever. But because you are continually introducing new strands as old ones give out, the rope itself can carry on indefinitely. So, so throughout 
human history, that has mainly been how human lives have been lived. The children have grown up in family settings in which in everyday life they'd have contact with their parents and their grandparents. Learning would take place in, uh, in that contact and in the context of carrying out everyday productive activities, be they farming, fishing, or whatever it happened to be. But this, has, this notion of, of generations carrying along together and co-producing the future through their collaboration has given way in the modern imagination to something quite different. It's given way to the idea of the generation as a layer. So here's one generation, or like in the pages of this, of this pad, here's one generation, and then we'll put on a new layer, that's the next generation, and the next generation, and the next generation. So each generation in a sequence over time is destined to replace the one that went before it on a blank sheet. And in that view, then, Every generation occupies its own slice of time so that life goes on within generations and not between them as each generation is destined to replace its successor. Uh, this, this view of, of generational succession is very, very deeply entrenched. In, in modern biology, for example, there's this idea that what goes on between generations is inheritance. That's what they call phylogeny. What goes on within generations is life. That's what they call ontogeny. And it, they're, they're, they're set along completely contrasting axes. In most diagrams, phylogeny, that's the, inherit, the line of inheritance, is usually vertical in the diagram. Ontogeny, the line of growth and development, is usually horizontal. And that's the way in which it's commonly depicted. So we end up with this dissociation between life going on within generations and inheritance going on between generations. What is passed on from one generation to the next is not life itself, but the property, the property, the characteristics, the traits that are needed to get it restarted in the next. Now, this is where we come to the distinction that we talked about uh, of, uh, the other day uh, between tradition and heritage. Because tradition is about following in the footsteps of predecessors, about improvising a passage into the future in continuity with the values of the past. So when, when the, uh, the filial generation, the generation of, of sons and daughters, follows in the footsteps of their their parents and their grandparents, they are carrying on a tradition in their ongoing life. And that was how traditions were, traditions is, is about carrying on a process of life. It doesn't mean it all has to be the same. It just means that the, 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 the process should carry on in continuity with the values of the past. There is no, there's no breach there but uh, one is continually improvised. A way of life is, is not a set of rules that are fixed in stone. A way of life is something that you follow and find a way through uh, in the world that you encompass. So tradition carries on, uh, but, but heritage, which of course comes from inheritance, is something different. It's like a layer that has been put behind you uh, over which the next generation writes. I, I, I was thinking as an analogy that um, that when I began uni as a university teacher, I, in those days I was quite a technological whiz kid and, uh, and, and, and the department had just acquired a contraption called an overhead projector. N nobody else used it. They were too frightened of it. I was very keen on the overhead projector because I could uh, draw. I was giving lectures with lots of diagrams and I could prepare by putting diagrams on these different acetate sheets. And I could even put an acetate sheet down with something written on it and then put another one on top and I could write on it. And then on the screen, people would see both sets of writing together. But the thing is, 
that when you put one sheet on top of another, although my writing on the new sheet can overlay the writing on the previous one, it cannot make any contact with it. So one overlays the other without making contact. So in heritage, in the transmission of heritage, it is impossible to follow literally in the footsteps of one's predecessors. You can only overwrite them, but you cannot follow them. There can be no direct contact between your footsteps and the footsteps of the past. So whilst then tradition is longitudinal, like a braid, heritage is like a layer in a vertical stack of horizontal layers. And with heritage, you can retrace the paths and patterns of the past without ever making contact with them. You can't continue them in that sense. So that means that to follow a tradition is to carry on a lineage, whereas to enact a heritage is to add on another layer. So we have the difference here between the lineage, as it carries on over time, the lineage and the layer. But the thing is that the world we inhabit is not actually a layer, not in our experience. And um, so just going back to the idea of the sheet of paper, here's a, sh a sheet of paper. We, we might inhabit the ground rather as the scribe I began with was really in his writing inhabiting the parchment. His mind, his thoughts were right there in the surface. But that ground he inhabited was actually what I've called a deep surface, which is not so much a layer separating what's on top from what's underneath as a zone of interpenetration. And all life is lived in that zone. That is, we don't, um, contra a quote from Bruno Latour, which uh, was mentioned in one moment in, a, in one of our presentations, contrary to Bruno Latour, I don't think we inhabit a thin layer between this and that. Uh, I think we inhabit a zone of interpenetration where, um, where earth and atmosphere uh, meet and mingle, and that's where everything grows. And that then is the ground. Now, just to take this distinction a bit further, between the lineage and the layer. Remember, the lineage is a, is a tradition of life carrying on through time, through generations, like the strands of the rope. The layer is the stack, one generation placed on top of the other. Um, with the lineage, the past is active in the present as it pushes forward into the future. So, People, as they proceed through life, are in some senses the creatures of their past, moving forward, pushing forward into the future. But with the layer, the past is covered over by the present, sinking ever further down as life goes on. So if you imagine, if you imagine life is a series of strata, then you put every new stratum you put on top, then the further down the previous ones go. So, so the past goes down, 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 down with the addition of every new layer. Now that brings us to the question that we also discussed a good deal about nostalgia. Uh, whatever its original etymological derivation in the, uh, amongst homesick soldiers in the Napoleonic War, I think that nostalgia as we understand it today is a product of this layered view of the past and the present. Um, it is, I think, a longing for a past that is not active in the present, but already over, already finished. It's a, it's a longing for something that can be not brought back in the active mode into the present. And that's just one why we feel nostalgic about it. You might say, oh, I wish you know, I could be back in the past and knowing that that past is irrecoverable. It was back then, it's finished, it's over, it's a foreign country now, 
we do things differently, and so on. So, and, and that is quite different from the kind of looping back into the past in order to carry it forward, which we know as storytelling. When we tell a story about things, we, it, it's a bit like knitting. When you, when you knit with a strand, you, 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 you pick up a loop and then you pull it forward through into the, into the present, into the ongoing uh, work. So, so storytelling is a kind of loop, a looping movement that, that goes back, picks up, and follows on through, uh, rather than a layering movement. And that's why I think telling stories from the past is quite the opposite of an exercise in nostalgia. And it's exactly that same difference as the one I've tried to set out between the lineage and the layer, or between tradition and heritage. And it also relates to what I've just been saying about the ground. That is, do we think of the ground as a series of layers with the oldest layers deepest down? That is, should we compare the ground to an archive you know, in which we've been just been depositing documents one on top of the other and you know, the, the, the more we add more documents, the older ones go deeper down. Is, is, do we think of the ground as an archive like that? Is memory work then a matter of digging down? Or is it about, is memory work about turning the ground in such a way as to bring the past into the present such that we can actively engage with it and and not only engage with it but carry it forward into the future that is, is it like cultivating a vine from the roots and that is quite the opposite of thinking of the ground as an archive some people some scholars have called it an, an archive because far from everything sinking down the ground keeps coming up it keeps turning around and coming up in the fruits of a productive soil. And of course, in Thirasia, we have seen both in the record of layers from successive volcanic eruptions, where the strata are very, very beautifully visible, but also in the work of building and cultivation in which the earth rises up into the forms of architecture and the forms of plants such as vines. So we see both things going on. And through all of that, uh, I mean, I, I think right at the beginning of the symposium with, with this perplexing title, Under the Landscape, it, it, the, the, the academic mind is immediately prompted to think, what do we mean by under? And then think of all possible senses that under could have. But I think we've arrived at two diff distinct understandings of under and that's a big there um, one is as under meaning progressively lower levels in a stack so this page down here is under this page up here or as what is coming up rather than going down in a continuous process of turning and we find these two senses of under, even in the idea of understanding. What do we mean by understanding? It's a bit the same problem as what we mean by under the landscape. How do we think of understanding as a sedimentation of knowledge already laid down? So each generation laid down its stratum of knowledge and, and, and so we got a stack with old knowledge at the bottom and new knowledge at the top and, and that we rest on those when, when we ourselves seek to understand where we're sort of standing on all these strata of, of previous knowledge underneath it, is, is it a sedimentation of knowledge already laid down, or is it, is understanding a way, an act, way of actively knowing that moves us all collectively forward? Or let's put it another way, is it underneath or is it underway? Underway means, of course, we've got moving. The train has left the platform and we're, we are under, but what we're under is a movement that is carrying us forward into the future, underneath or underway, which again corresponds to these two different 
approaches that, that, that one could place under the, the rubric uh, layer versus lineage or heritage versus tradition. But then what about this word landscape? I, I have actually avoided deliberately getting caught up in the complex semantics of the term, partly because uh, many scholars, including uh, Ken here and, and Carsten earlier on, and many, many others have dwelt in this in great, uh, uh, great length and have done a much better job than I could possibly do. Um, we know that, um, that the term landscape itself has, has uh, its meanings have changed from those early medieval times when it was caught up with the customs and practices of agrarian life, today with all its aesthetic and scenic connotations. We, we know that, and I don't need to repeat that story. I only want to stress how different it might have been had we started, had, had, we, had our language been French or Spanish or Italian or even, dare I say it, Greek. If our language had been French, say, we would have had a conference on uh, au-dessus de, de paysage, under the, the landscape with the paysage. Uh, if it was in Greek, it would be topio. Now, these have very different etymologies. And for, I only discovered recently, I, I should have known, that paysage comes from the Latin pagus, uh, uh, we number e even the English word peasant comes from the same root. Pagus meaning originally an area of countryside, an area of inhabited countryside with its fields and farms. Basically, that's what pagus means. And just to get back to our monk from Verona, of course, it's from pagus that we get the word page. So the, the analogy between the inhabited landscape with its fields and farms and the page of parchment on which the monk was writing was right there from the start. And, and so if, we'd, if, if our key term had been paysage rather than landscape, we would have been cast immediately into this arena of, of writing the land in one scribal activity. Um, if we had started with Greek, Topio, again, whatever the dictionary says, I, I don't know what it says, but that topos means place. And, and, I, th and I think that the best possible translation of topio would be the place of places, a kind of country in which, which is made up of places, but in which every place in the landscape embodies within itself its relations to all the other places. So you know a place for what it is, because that's the way the world looks like from there. You go to another place and the world will look like look differently and that defines that other place for what it is. But to get from one place to another, you have to cross no boundary. It's just a matter of changing your position. So the field of debate, I think, would have been defined rather differently uh, depending on what language we had started with. And of course, those are just three languages, uh, French, English, Greek. And amongst all the languages of the world, one would find an immense variation, which could have set our discussions going in all sorts of different ways. However, it seems that landscape, paysage, and topio all have their foundation in human customs and practices, whether they be of farming, of writing, or placemaking. When we're talking about landscape, paysage, topio, the humans are always there, kind of at the center of things. To the extent that you would think no humans, no landscape. And yet, of course, the world that we inhabit is inhabited by manifold non-human beings as well. So the question arises, can they have landscapes of their own? I don't mean, can we find non-human beings in human landscapes, that's obviously the case, they're all, they're all around. But can, can animals themselves, on their own terms, have their own landscapes? Would it make any sense to say that, talk about the landscape of the goat or the cow or the reindeer, whatever it might be? 
would there, would it, would it, or put it another way, would a world without humans still be a landscape? Or do we need other terms, such as, for example, environment, or uh, the one who excludes term Umwelt, or Ecumene, or Milieu? And then what about humans who are not farmers? We know that uh, in the etymology of landscape, at least, the term is very closely tied to a specifically agrarian, agrarian regime. Does it then make sense to suggest that pastoral herdsmen uh, who may maybe were not doing any cultivation or hunter-gatherers, did they inhabit landscapes? Or is that a contradiction in terms? Perhaps we should say no, they don't, of, of the animals, of the pastoralists, of the hunter-gatherers, no, they don't inhabit a landscape. No, no, they in inhabit an environment. But there, there's a very great danger, isn't there, of, of naturalizing the hunter-gatherers, the pastoralists, and the animals too, and saying that unlike us, us humans, and specifically cultivating humans who till the soil, why the pastoralists and the hunter-gatherers are like animals, and the animals, they just have an environment. Um, because um, in the history of both the natural and the human sciences, the fact is that uh, ecologists working in the natural sciences have tended to go for environment, uh, art historians and others in the human sciences talking about human work, whether directly in the landscape or of representation, have tended to talk about landscape. So it, the, the, the dif distinction between landscape and environment has tended to get parceled up uh, along this division between the humanities and the natural sciences. So inevitably, if we start talking about environment rather than landscape, it sounds as though we're sort of naturalizing things. An alternative word which I like and which was raised often in our discussions um, and has been particularly advocated by Augustin Berg is milieu. And milieu is a term I like uh, very much in this. I think it works very well to convey the idea that all life, whether human life, animal life, plant life, is carried on in the midst of things. It's always going on in between. The plant root has to find a way through all the other bits and stuff that's growing in the environment. The, uh, the, the, the animal has to trace a path through the landscape. Humans, too, lay their lines in the, in the land as they move about and uh, in, in their everyday uh, activities. And, and the result is a kind of uh, entanglement, what Henri Lefebvre uh, called a meshwork, actually. Uh, nature writes on the land, he said, in a scrawling hand. It's a tangle, a mess. But, but the idea of milieu, I think, captures this tangle very well without us having to um, impose any sort of hierarchy between humans and, and nature. So in the milieu, uh, life is lived in the midst of things in this zone of penetration where the ground's rising meets the sky's falling. But then we might ask another question. If in our discussions about landscape, it seems as though humans are always present, often engaged in activities of cultivation, is a landscape perspective then necessarily anthropocentric? And perhaps it is. And of course, anthropocentrism has come in, particularly in the last decade or two, for some pretty harsh criticism. We're always attacking ourselves for being anthropocentric. And this anthropocentrism is taken to be a sort of selfish attitude that uh, treats, uh, puts us first, us humans, whatever, and treats the rest of the planet as merely a set of reserves from which we can extract stuff for our own benefit. So usually anthropocentrism is taken to mean an attitude that takes us, the anthropos, out of the world. And actually that doesn't place us in the center at all, but it places us all around on the outside. 
uh, I remember an experiment that was conducted by uh, some developmental biologists who were trying to figure out how young children understand the shape of the earth. And so they asked the children to draw the earth and some children drew it as a straight line, so other children drew it as a circle. So with the ones who drew it, drew the earth as a circle, uh, they said, well, now put some people in it. And some people put a, a sort of stick figure in the middle of the circle and other people put some stick figures around the edge. And they were told then that the ones who put the stick figure in the middle of the circle, they hadn't really got it right. The people who put the stick figures around the edge of the circle, they had got it right. That was a scientifically correct view of the Earth. Namely, here is the planet, a solid planet with a core the, and the mantle and the crust. And all around the outside, covering the Earth like an envelope, is, is humanity. So humans... This is not anthropocentrism because the kids who put the human in the middle had got it wrong. This is anthropocircumferentialism. I don't know, but I'm not, not expecting anybody to buy this word. It's impossible. But nevertheless, what we're really talking about is not the, the fault, is not that we put humans right there in the middle. The fault is that we put humans all around on the outside, or if we have a pyramid view, we might say there's someone on the top uh, looking down on the rest of the world underneath. So in that view, this is a perspective not of inhabitation, but of exhabitation. It's making humans exhabitants of the world. Now the problem with that view uh, of anthropocircumferentialism is that it sets up eco-centrism eco as its complementary opposite. And indeed, many critics of so-called anthropocentrism say what they really want is an eco-centric perspective that will put the eco or the ecumeni first. But as the complementary opposition of a view that places humans all around on the outside, eco-centrism leaves us with a picture of the world in which there is no place for humans to be. It sets us up in a condition where almost a priori, humans are denied any possibility to play a constructive role in the world's functioning, in the world's flourishing. So that is not really very helpful either. And I, do, I think instead we should be pleading for a genuine anthropocentrism, yes, anthropocentrism, that would place humans back at the heart of the inhabited world, enmeshed in relations of reciprocity, founded on an ontological commitment to give back to the world what they owe for their own existence within it. We owe our very existence as living beings to the world of which we are part. And in the sense, in that sense, we are in debt to it and our, our lives are, in a sense, some form of repaying the world for the debt we owe to it for our existence. And that would be the heart, at the heart of a genuine anthropocentrism. And actually, through most of human history, through most of history, uh, as we've actually learned during our, our few days, human activities have contributed a great deal to the flourishing of non-human forms of life. Environments worked by humans over millennia are still among the most biodiverse and flourishing environments on the planet. I mean, we're now busily destroying them, but until that destruction set in, certainly uh, environments modified by humans flourished in many senses more than environments that had not been modified by humans. So humans have actually played a, a role in producing this flourishing planet that we're privileged to inhabit. So I think we should be campaigning for the restoration of that kind of anthropocentrism rather than its abolition. But I've been talking about humans as though, you know, we're all just humans and that's it that it comes back to the question of who exactly we are. 
And sh can we, should we, define ourselves collectively as we humans, as distinct from non-humans, or more than humans, or other than humans, or whatever fancy phrase is uh, fashionable these days. I think the point is that in a world of life, this term we, we have to, we can't avoid using it, but this term we has to be understood relationally rather than categorically. In categorical terms, we is set up in opposition to them. There's the category of us, uh, united by sharing some interests, features, characteristics and properties in, in, in common as against them. But relationally, we is something that radiates from the place where I am outwards to draw in our fellow traveling companions of whatever species they might happen to be. Those are our, the people we're going, going along with in life our conversational partners, our fellow travelers, the animals we live with, the plants we live with. But of course, that we-ness does not make us all the same. We're not all the same because we are a we. We are simply those inhabitants who are going along together and communing, conversing with one another. And every such we is in fact hybrid is multi-species. So we is always a community, but it is always a community defined by difference. We can converse, we can exchange, we can communicate precisely because we are not all the same. Now all of that was really just a preamble to the big issue, the big issue, the crisis that is staring us all in the face today. And of course, it's the crisis, the question of the future. Because it seems that uh, tourism, global techno science, industrialized food production, the climate emergency, the mass migration of the poor, the unemployed and the dispossessed, all seem to be part of the same thing and they all are bound up in this idea that has gained so much currency now of the Anthropocene. We seem to be in a time when all these things are interconnected and going on together and are imposing a kind of layer over the world which is cutting off and truncating every lineage. You remember the distinction between the lineage and the layer? The lineage is life carrying on along all these different streams and different traditions. So we can ma imagine maybe them coming up like that and then a layer slicing right across them and saying there's no way forward beyond that. So at the same time that tourists descend upon the land and pressure, we seem to impose this pressure from above, at the same time as that is happening, uh, the uh, areas where food was grown, cultivation, where, 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 where land was cultivating, are being emptied of people at the same time that science is turning the earth into an object of observation and research. When developments in artificial intelligence and robotics are propelling us towards a future in which the majority of human beings on the planet will be surplus to requirements with the result of being a flood of people with nowhere to go and nothing to do. This is <laughs> the issue that we are confronted with. So it's like that this Anthropocene is like a, a final layer which, depending on your point of view, marks either a final, a final solution, which in geoengineering terms will fix the planet once and for all for the benefit of a globally distributed humanity, or it will mean the ultimate extinction of life. But either way, whether we believe that there is a technical fix for the Earth that will uh, secure 
humanity for all time or whether we believe we're all heading for extinction, neither option offers us anything like a future. That is to say, the future is no future at all. A geotechnical future is no future at all. Extinction is no future at all. So the question that faces us all is this, how can we find our way back into a future that is a future? And that means a future that carries on, that offers life to the generations that follow ours, and that is sustainable in the proper sense of uh, life that can be carried on. So it means actually moving back from the layer to the lineage. How can we switch back from thinking of history as this sequence of layers with the top layer somehow finishing us all off to thinking of history as a rope, as a cord that will just keep on winding for as long as new people keep coming into the world to replace those that pass away. Now there's much talk. Fortunately, we haven't heard the I, we haven't one word, and I, I'm so pleased we haven't heard it over these last few days. Is posthumanism. I'm very glad that we haven't heard that word. But of course, there is much talk about it in theoretical circles about a uh, a future that will take us beyond humanism understood. I think as the ideal of a one-way progressive movement towards civilization based on uh, the uh, human ascent over nature and the extraction of resources to support it. Uh, we are very aware of the colonial underpinnings of that uh, doctrine of progress. And we know we have reached that we have reached a point at which progress and sustainability can no longer be had together. Although mm, there are still people trying to show that they can somehow, through some jiggery pokery, marry progress and sustainability um, of what we have, I think, become, become aware of is that you can't have both. We can't have both progress and sustainability and only sustainability carrying on allows us a future. So if we want a future, that is the only choice we've got. So, um, so that's what, what, what the post-humanists are after. But by the same token, we have to imagine not only what will be a post-human world, but what will be a post-science world? What will be a post-tourism world? I mean, scientists don't often think about what a world would be after science when scientism has run out of steam. And we're not even thinking very much about what would what comes after tourism? What comes after tourism? What comes after science? Because those are the things we have to think about if we really want a future. And from everything I've said so far, the answer I propose should be kind of obvious, and that is that we have to shift once again from thinking of layers to thinking of lineages. That is, from a lateral to a longitudinal conception of life and history. So it's a matter, once again, of rethinking generations and how generations follow one another. And I want to draw out just three aspects of this rethinking, which I'll, I'll conclude with this. And this is <laughs> all three aspects of things that are still whirring in my brain now. So I, I probably can't give you a very coherent statement of any of them, but here goes. The first aspect has to do with food production, the second with education, and the third with what most of us are doing, and that is research and scholarship. And I think the first is most basic, food production. We have to start there because quite obviously human beings have to eat in order to live, and that means harvesting the fruits of the earth that is from its lands and from its waters. And throughout history, human beings have worked the land and uh, worked its waters as farmers, as herdsmen, as hunters, gatherers, fishermen, and so on. 
curiosity. And, and I mentioned at the beginning that at the time in the eighth century, when our monk was writing his riddle about the, the comparing the page and writing, everybody then knew how to handle a plow. Uh, the um, today, uh, I remember a story told by the founder of the slow food movement. His name has suddenly gone out of my head, but he, the founder of the slow food movement, said he had been in a a big meeting of school children in Italy, and he had asked of this meeting of a thousand or so school children, well, how many of you want to be farmers when you grew up? And a couple of people put their hands up, two out of a thousand. And he said, well, how on earth are we going to secure the future of food production if nobody actually wants to farm? Now, the point is that, that, that food production is going on because it has been brought under massive, uh, massively industrialized, mechanized, automatized agriculture that has pushed most people off the land because it requires, it ha it's very labor intensive, sorry, labor extensive and, and land extensive. So, so what, what, what's happened today, uh, where, where we've moved from a situation when the vast majority of people on the planet worked directly with the land and water in producing foodstuffs, uh, either for themselves or for trade with their immediate neighbors, to a situation in which a, a, a small minority of people around the world are engaged in fact such activities. And of course, the knowledge that goes with them is being rapidly lost to be replaced by technical um, technical and engineering expertise. So the countryside has emptied out. That connection with the land is lost. And uh, we have a, a, a layer of affluent tourists who then come in to look at this emptied countryside and whatever bits of heritage it can find. So it seems as though the world is divided between the affluent, the, between the affluent, the migrant workers who serve the needs of the affluent, and the rural poor, who many of whom uh, are in favor of tourist-related development on the grounds that it will give them something to do, that will give them employment. So I think this is a this is a short term uh, kind of phony argument that is repeatedly adduced that we have to develop further develop tourism because otherwise former the former inhabitants of rural regions who used to produce the food of the earth will have nothing else to do otherwise there will be surplus of requirements. So we end up in this situation that we've got today. And, and, and it clearly is an unsustainable situation, um, uh, partly because it, um, it, 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 it leads to a huge dependencies on food supplies from distant parts of the world, and partly because of the immensely long supply chains between the producers and the consumers of food. And the Ukraine crisis, of course, has brought this home to all of us, that a war in Ukraine threatens famine in several continents of the earth, shows precisely what has gone wrong when we take everybody off the land, uh, how much uh, we lose our food security. Only one thing can go wrong and people uh, will starve. So we have to bring people, I, I think there's no alternative to bringing people back onto the land and water, of course, in roles as producers of food. Uh, and that means, amongst other things, bringing architecture and agriculture together. Whether people live in towns or in the country perhaps is becoming less of an important issue. The important thing is that places where people live more or less densely should also be understood as places where they produce food. That, I think, is the only recipe for sustainability. And 
as was said during our meetings, everything then depends on the fertility of the soil. So just as we need to bring back people back into a productive relationship with the land, we have to reclaim the soils. So then, um, in such a world, what will happen to tourism? You might say, well, um, if everybody's busy producing their own food, they don't have very many chances to go on holiday. Uh, and maybe that doesn't matter. I mean, but the fact is that, that um, people have always, I mean, throughout history, right, right from prehistory, we know from records of how raw materials, uh, valuable materials were traded around this Mediterranean region, for example, that people have always moved and mixed and material goods and stories and ideas have moved even more so as they pass from, from mouth to mouth, hand to hand. So there is no returning to a condition in which everyone lives in their own little bubble, their own little enclave, their own little territory, for the simple reason that no such condition ever existed. Uh, that, that throughout history, so far as we know, there's always been a movement of people. And indeed, such movement is part of the living conversation that is life itself. It's part of history. And some people would argue, therefore, well, tourism is just the latest version of this kind of movement that has always been going on. But I think it is not. I think there is a difference between the traveling that humans have always done and the tourism that we have today. Because traveling is part of a conversation in which we, we, we might say that we are all travelers on this earth. And as we meet and mingle and exchange and converse, we work together to co-produce a collective future. That is what traveling and mixing and mingling entails and has always entailed. Tourism is different because tourists are not contributing to the co-production of a common future. They are consumers of a heritage good that is being marketed to them. So the logic is entirely different, different in precisely the same way as the layer differs from the lineage. Or perhaps to adopt another image, different in the way that the circle where a song goes round and round differs from the performance in which a troupe or a choir lines up to perform to an audience. It's the same difference. So that's on food production. Then turning to education, uh, I was recently rereading an essay written by Hannah Arendt in the mid-1950s entitled The Crisis of Education. Uh, she was uh, writing in her time and it was uh, soon after the Second World War and responding to, to much of what had happened then. But uh, there's this memorable phrase in this essay in which Arendt, Arendt says, do we love the world enough to take responsibility for it? Only if we do is there hope for generations to come. If not, the only thing that lies ahead is ruin. And what she meant by that was that in a proper education, it is the job of the senior generation to introduce new people, it's young people, introduce new people as they come along into the old ways. That's what she means by loving the world. They love the world so much that when new people come in, they want to tell these new people all about this old world that they know. And the whole point is that only by doing so will those new people then be able to make and continue making that world for themselves. So what looks like a conservative ideology is that, you know, introduce children to the old ways is actually an ideology that makes it possible for the rope to carry on makes it possible for generation after generation to renew the current of life. And what she was against, absolutely, was the idea of an education that says the old ways of the past, they're over. We are now have a new social order, 
and in our education we will prepare you for it and control the conditions of your admission into it. That, she says, is propaganda and that way lies ruin. Of course, we know what she was talking about after the Second World War, but uh, it still applies, I think, today to an educational system that is still geared towards preparing the new generation for the challenges of a world that has already been set up for them and, into, uh, and the admission into which is controlled by them rather than educating children in the familiar ways of the past that will then allow them to move on. So that, I think, is, is absolutely critical and why uh, the move that we need to reclaim the future has to involve a complete revolution in the dominant ideologies of education which surround us today. Then that leads finally to what happens to our own scholarship and and that's where things get a little uncomfortable because we at least the academics among us have to realize that um, as part of the whole academic research science apparatus we are to some extent complicit in this process which has turned the world into uh, an object to be analyzed to be looked at to be controlled to be dominated to be layered over rather than one to join with in our conversations. And we notice it in, even in the way we talk about our scholarly predecessors. We're inclined, I think, rather than to join with those predecessors in our conversation, to engage with them, to, to analyze what they said and put them in their social and historical context. I found that there's nothing that gets me more annoyed than the historian or the anthropologist who says that the way to understand everything you see, student, you see, student, what we do is we understand things by putting them in their social, cultural, and historical context. We embed them. We put them to sleep. We neutralize them so that they're fully understood, so that they no longer challenge us. They no longer confront us head on as things we have to engage with, we can put them away and put them into their context. So uh, I was delighted when uh, uh, Lucretius was presented with us as a possible example of how we might proceed in our scholarly writing. Suppose we wrote like that. Suppose that what we wrote was a kind of poetic engagement with the world that we find ourselves in, a kind of celebration. And suppose that we read our predecessors in the way we read Lucretius, not to analyze it, but to converse with it and, and move our subjects forward through that conversation of bringing earlier writings into the present so that we can move them into the future. So finally, that I think is why we need words. Uh, words have been somewhat demonized in recent uh, scholarship in the humanities partly because of the way in which they are used by acad academics who rather tend to think of language as a means to explicate, to set out, to explain what is there. And by resort to the notion of tacit knowledge, which has come up now and again, to actually uh, deny uh, those who are directly engaged with worldly matters, to deny them a voice, to silence them. In fact, if anything silences the world, it is explication. The words that 
we often use in our academic research are words that pin things down, that articulate, that explicate, that join up and pin down and deny movement and feeling. But without movement, there can be no sound. Without feeling, there can be no sound. And words, when we use them, are things of movement and feeling. They come well up uh, from our bodies in the breath, in speech, even in writing, when we gesture them, and are very a part of the way in which we make ourselves, it's our human way of making ourselves present in the world. So I think we have to advocate for a form of scholarship which comes back to that sort of conversational engagement, which is what the word research actually means. Research means to search and search again, a double search, a search that goes over what went before at the same time as moving into the new. It's like walking the same footpath over and over again. Every walk both goes over the same ground but also is, um, is an original movement in its turn, which carries us forward in life as in that looping of traditional storytelling. So we need to become researchers in that sense and scholars in that sense. Um, and I've finished with this phrase that I've written down just two minutes before I began to speak. I still don't know what it means, but I've written words bubble up through the fault lines of understanding. I don't know what that means, but you can think about it. <laughs>